Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Janie Krekow, and I am the training and support person at the Federation for Children with Special Needs in the Recruitment Training and Support Center, um, which deals with recruiting and training and supporting people that are volunteering to become special education surrogate parents and work with kids in child welfare. Um, I'm presenting today, so I will introduce myself. Um, my background is as a special education teacher. Um, I also worked in the community as a therapist um, years ago for family um, stabilization teams through private insurance and then more recently through the Child Behavioral Health Initiative through Mass Health. Um, so I was back and forth between the community and schools. Um, I learned about the ACEs survey when I started working here, um, and it really was a, a game changer for me, and I hope it becomes a game changer for you also when you find out exactly what it's about and how important it is for kids um, that have suffered from um, complex trauma. Um, let's see, my my crew today is, is Renee Williams and Aaron Anguish, they're behind the cameras. Um, and hopefully um, things go well. We are gonna be showing a video today, so keep your fingers crossed that it goes well. Um, and as usual, please uh, type your questions in the toolbox um, and I will try and answer them. I'm, I'm doing both jobs today, so I probably will wait to the end to answer your questions, but if it pops up and it seems to be um, something of, of importance, I will try and answer it during the presentation. Um, so, I guess we're ready to go with the adverse childhood experience um, as uh, seen as being a hidden public health crisis. So we're going to start, first of all, um, with a, a history of the ACEs study. I, I find it fascinating, um, and I'm a, kind of a science buff anyway, research buff, and um, the way this came about was just fascinating to me. Um, we're going to do a TED Talk or a TED Med Talk. Uh, that's the video by Dr. Nadine Burke Harris, which um, is very impressive. She's a beautiful woman, a pediatrician in California, who is just a wonderful presenter and lets us know exactly what the uh, ACE study was about and its repercussions. And then we're going to talk a little bit about how the study changed everything from focusing on symptoms of trauma to the underlying causes of the trauma. And um, in the end, we'll talk a little bit about the impact on schools and families. And as I say, if you have any questions, just please um, type them into the toolbox. So the ACE study um, was started in 1997 uh, by, with a collaboration between the Centers for Disease Control and Pre Prevention and the Kaiser Permanente Health Appraisal Clinic in San Diego. So the two people that are most um, respected and um, are identified as being the main authors of the study are Dr. Felitti um, on the left and Dr. Anda on the right. Dr. Anda works, uh, works for the CDC and Dr. Felitti, I believe, still works for uh, Kaiser Permanente, which is an HMO um, in California, big one. So how it all started, well, let me look at the, um, yeah, how it all started was, uh, was through an ob obesity study. So Dr. Felitti worked in a clinic in San Diego that was trying to determine the um, etiology of why certain people um, suffered from obesity. And um, he was very mystified by a, uh, a huge dropout um, of the clinic, uh, even though people came in saying they wanted to be in the study, they wanted to be um, part of the intervention um, because of their obesity, but they had a tremendous number of people drop out. And when he looked at the dropout rate, he saw that the people who had come in um, were born at a normal rate. So they weren't, there was nothing genetic about it. They were uh, typically sized infants. Um, and when they did gain weight, it was very quick, it was very abrupt. And once they gained the weight, it was stabilized for a long period of time until an intervention was started and then they could lose the weight um, and then a cycle restarted it again. 
So when he started to look into it, because he was a man who was fascinated by data and um, was uh, and a researcher, he found out that of the 286 people who um, he interviewed about um, why they were dropping out, most had, had been sexually abused as children. And that got him thinking about, goodness, what has that got to do with the um, people gaining weight? Um, so he started asking some curious questions, and uh, what they did was started to think about the ACE study survey questions. So he was in Washington, and uh, Dr. David Williamson, who is an epidemiologist also uh, at the CDC, in, uh, do introduced Dr. Felitti to Dr. Anda. And they got together and history was made. Um, and they decided to, based on this small amount of data that they had from the obesity clinic, um, they decided to ask as many people as possible through um, their department at Kaiser Permanente to answer um, some questions for them. And um, the history is fascinating. They asked if they would be interested in helping us understand how childhood events um, might affect adult health. So they went from obesity to other indicators of uh, um, long-term outcomes. So of the 26,000 people that they asked, um, 17 and a half thousand agreed to do it. And it became what is called in research a mega study, which meant that it had a, a, a great impact on um, the data. So they began uh, interviewing people in 1995 um, and they continued through 1997. And the best part about the survey is they subsequently um, have been interviewing them uh, for the last years. Uh, it was 15 years. Um, I do believe they're still following up with some of the people about their long-term health, health outcomes. And Dr. Anda, um, after seeing the initial results, um, and this is a quote for him, from him, he said, I saw how much people had suffered and I wept. So it was one of those moments where things started to come together for the researchers um, and um, how, how this, these, this um, complex childhood trauma had such an amazing um, impact on long-term health outcomes. So let's look at the people who answered the questions. Um, interestingly, um, this is very different from today's uh, ACE studies. 75% of them were white, um, some Latinos, this was in San Diego. Um, a few of them were Asian or Pacific Islanders. 5% were black. 36% um, had, had attended college. All had jobs and all had health care because it was through an HMO that they were conducting the survey. The average age of the, pers the people that they were surveying was 57, so um, they were well into their um, adulthood and suffering a lot of them from some long-term health outcomes that were not good. So what were the questions that Dr. Felitti and Dr. Anda asked these uh, 17,000 people? Um, this morning I sent out to you as an attachment two different ACE studies. So uh, the first one um, that we're going to talk about was the original ACE study and that included 10 questions. Um, and I sent it out to you because you can actually take your own ACE score. It is very easily scored. Um, essentially the questions are around emotional, physical, and sexual abuse um, as a child, household dysfunction, um, whether uh, the mom was the um, victim of domestic violence, uh, was anybody in the household a, a substance user? Was anybody incarcerated? Um, was anyone in the household uh, mentally ill or had been in a psychiatric facility? Um, or you were not raised by both biological parents? Um, and then neglect, were you physically or emotionally neglected? So every time you said yes to one of these questions, and this, the questions um, you can see on your questionnaire that I sent out were very specific, little graphic. Um, if you said yes, that was considered one ace. And simply what was done was Dr. Felitti and, and Dr. Anda um, added up the yeses, and that became your ace score. 
So the two most important findings, and there, there have been hundreds, if not thousands, of findings from the ACE study as the years have gone by, um, almost 20 years now, the two most incredible findings that Dr. Felitti and Dr. Ann never thought they would find was that they were much more common um, than recognized or acknowledged. So in other words, people were not eager to talk about them until they were specifically asked. Um, and they also were a robust indicator of long-term health outcomes. So what they did essentially was after they asked about the adverse childhood experiences, they correlated them to the uh, specific person's long-term outcomes, health outcomes. And there was a, a very clear correlation between the two. And here's the amount of people who had suffered um, an ACE. Um, ha over half of the uh, participants had experienced one or more of the categories um, that we spoke of a couple of slides ago, over half. So that means that in the population, in San Diego anyway, um, more than 50% of the people had suffered one or more um, ACEs. One in four were exposed to two categories of adverse experience and one in 16 were exposed to four categories. So th these were numbers that no one expected. They had no idea that um, childhood abuse, and neglect, and other adver um, adverse experiences were as commonplace um, as uh, they found out. And here's a nice graph of um, how common are they. Uh, and this was based on the original study, just so you know. Um, only a third, about a third of the population asked had no ACEs. Now these were self-reported um, and self-reported ACEs and these are from people that were 57. Um, I'm not sure you ever forget an ACE, um, but you might still, even though it's a blind survey, might not want to um, answer uh, positively that these things had happened. So, um, but uh, you can see the percentages of, of, um, of people there. Um, so, coming up next is a video of uh, Dr. Nadine, Nadine Burke Harris. Um, as I said, she's a, a pediatrician in San Diego and she had a life changing, um, her practice completely changed after she came up be aware of the ACE study. So I'm going to have you look at the video. Um, it's about 15 minutes long and then we'll go back and kind of talk about it and the, um, the the impact of ACEs on um, the developing brain and stuff like that. In the mid-90s, the CDC and Kaiser Permanente discovered an exposure that dramatically increased the risk for seven out of ten of the leading causes of death in the United States. In high doses, it affects brain development, the immune system, hormonal systems, and even the way our DNA is read and transcribed. Folks who are exposed in very high doses have triple the lifetime risk of heart disease and lung cancer and a 20-year difference in life expectancy. And yet doctors today are not trained in routine screening or treatment. Now, the exposure I'm talking about is not a pesticide or a packaging chemical. It's childhood trauma. Okay, what kind of trauma am I talking about here? I'm not talking about failing a test or losing a basketball game. I am talking about threats that are so severe or pervasive that they literally get under our skin and change our physiology. Things like abuse or neglect or growing up with a parent who struggles with mental illness or substance dependence. Now, for a long time, I viewed these things in the way I was trained to view them, either as a social problem, refer to social services, or as a mental health problem, refer to mental health services. And then something happened to make me rethink my entire approach. When I finished my residency, I wanted to go someplace where I felt really needed, someplace where I could make a difference. So I came to work for California Pacific Medical Center, one of the best private hospitals in Northern California. And together, we opened a clinic in Bayview Hunters Point, one of the poorest, most underserved neighborhoods in San Francisco. Now, prior to that point, 
There had been only one pediatrician in all of Bayview to serve more than 10,000 children. So we hung a shingle, and we were able to provide top quality care regardless of ability to pay. It was so cool. We targeted the typical health disparities, access to care, immunization rates, asthma hospitalization rates, and we hit all of our numbers. We felt very proud of ourselves. But then I started noticing a disturbing trend. A lot of kids were being referred to me for ADHD, or Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. But when I actually did a thorough history and physical, what I found was that for most of my patients, I couldn't make a diagnosis of ADHD. Most of the kids I was seeing had experienced such severe trauma that it felt like something else was going on. Somehow, I was missing something important. Now, before I did my residency, I did a master's degree in public health. And one of the things that they teach you in public health school is that if you're a doctor and you see 100 kids that all drink from the same well, and 98 of them develop diarrhea, you can go ahead and write that prescription for dose after dose after dose of antibiotics, or you can walk over and say, what the hell is in this well? So I began reading everything that I could get my hands on about how exposure to adversity affects the developing brains and bodies of children. And then one day, my colleague walked into my office, and he said, Dr. Burke, have you seen this? In his hand was a copy of a research study called the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study. That day, changed my clinical practice and, ultimately, my career. The Adverse Childhood Experiences Study is something that everybody needs to know about. It was done by Dr. Vince Felitti at Kaiser and Dr. Bob Onda at the CDC, and together they asked 17 and a half thousand adults about their history of exposure to what they called Adverse Childhood Experiences, or ACEs. Those include physical, emotional, or sexual abuse, physical or emotional neglect, parental mental illness, substance dependence, incarceration, parental separation or divorce, or domestic violence. For every yes, you would get a point on your ACE score. And then what they did was they correlated these ACE scores against health outcomes. What they found was striking. Two things. Number one, ACEs are incredibly common. 67 percent of the population had at least one ACE, and 12.6 percent, one in eight, had four or more ACEs. The second thing that they found was that there was a dose-response relationship between ACEs and health outcomes. The higher your ACE score, the worse your health outcomes. For a person with an ACE score of four or more, their relative risk of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease was two and a half times that of someone with an ACE score of zero. For hepatitis, it was also two and a half times. For depression, it was four and a half times. For suicidality, it was 12 times. A person with an ACE score of seven or more had triple the lifetime risk of lung cancer and three and a half times the risk of ischemic heart disease, the number one killer in the United States of America. Well, of course, this makes sense. You know, some people looked at this data and they said, come on, you know, you have a rough childhood, you're more likely to drink and smoke and do all these things that are going to ruin your health. This isn't science. This is just bad behavior. It turns out this is exactly where the science comes in. We now understand better than we ever have before how exposure to early adversity affects the developing brains and bodies of children. It affects areas like the nucleus accumbens, the pleasure and reward center of the brain that is implicated in substance dependence.
It inhibits the prefrontal cortex, which is necessary for impulse control and executive function, a critical area for learning. And on MRI scans, we see measurable differences in the amygdala, the brain's fear response center. So there are real neurologic reasons why folks exposed to high doses of adversity are more likely to engage in high-risk behavior, and that's important to know. But it turns out that even if you don't engage in any high-risk behavior, you're still more likely to develop heart disease or cancer. The reason for this has to do with the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, the brain's and body's stress response system that governs our fight or flight response. How does it work? Well, imagine you're walking in the forest and you see a bear. Immediately, your hypothalamus sends a signal to your pituitary, which sends a signal to your adrenal gland that says, "Release stress hormones, adrenaline, cortisol." And so your heart starts to pound, your pupils dilate, your airways open up, and you are ready to either fight that bear or run from the bear. And that is wonderful. If you're in a forest and there's a bear, <laughs> but the problem is what happens when the bear comes home every night, and this system is activated over and over and over again, and it goes from being adaptive or life-saving to maladaptive or health-damaging. Children are especially sensitive to this repeated stress activation because their brains and bodies are just developing. High doses of adversity not only affect brain structure and function; they affect the developing immune system, developing hormonal systems, and even the way our DNA is read and transcribed. So, for me. This information threw my old training out the window, because when we understand the mechanism of a disease, when we know not only which pathways are disrupted, but how, then as doctors, it is our job to use this science for prevention and treatment. That's what we do. So in San Francisco, we created the Center for Youth Wellness to prevent. Screen and heal the impacts of ACEs and toxic stress. We started simply with routine screening of every one of our kids at their regular physical, because I know that if my patient has an ACE score of four, she's two and a half times as likely to develop hepatitis or COPD. She's four and a half times as likely to become depressed, and she's 12 times as likely to attempt to take her own life. As my patient with zero ACEs, I know that when she's in my exam room. For our patients who do screen positive, we have a multidisciplinary treatment team that works to reduce the dose of adversity and treat symptoms using best practices, including home visits, care coordination, mental health care, nutrition, holistic interventions, and yes, medication when necessary. But we also educate parents about the impact of ACEs and toxic stress the same way you would for covering electrical outlets or lead poisoning, and we tailor the care of our asthmatics and our diabetics in a way that recognizes that they may need more aggressive treatment given the changes to their hormonal and immune systems. So the other thing that happens when you understand this science is that you want to shout it from the rooftops. Because this isn't just an issue for kids in Bayview. I figured the minute that everybody else heard about this, it would be routine screening, multidisciplinary treatment teams, and it would be a race to the most effective clinical treatment protocols. Yeah, that did not happen, <laughs> and that was a huge learning for me. What I had thought of as simply best clinical practice, I now understand. To be a movement. In the words of Dr. Robert Block, the former president of the American Academy of Pediatrics, adverse childhood experiences are the single greatest unaddressed public health threat facing our nation today. 
And for a lot of people, that's a terrifying prospect. The scope and scale of the problem seem so large that it feels overwhelming to think about how we might approach it. But for me, that's actually where the hope lies. Because when we have the right framework, when we recognize this to be a public health crisis, then we can begin to use the right toolkit to come up with solutions. From tobacco to lead poisoning to HIV AIDS, the United States actually has quite a strong track record with addressing public health problems. But replicating those successes with ACEs and toxic stress is going to take determination and commitment. And when I look at what our nation's response has been so far, I wonder, why haven't we taken this more seriously? You know, at first, I thought that we marginalized the issue because it doesn't apply to us, right? That's an issue for those kids in those neighborhoods, which is weird because the data doesn't bear that out. The original ACEs study was done in a population that was 70% Caucasian, 70% college educated. But then, the more I talk to folks, I'm beginning to think that maybe I had it completely backwards. If I were to ask how many people in this room grew up with a family member who suffered from mental illness, I bet a few hands would go up. And then if I were to ask how many folks had a parent who maybe drank too much or who really believed that if you spare the rod, you spoil the child, I bet a few more hands would go up. Even in this room, this is an issue that touches many of us. And I'm beginning to believe that we marginalize the issue because it does apply to us. Maybe it's easier to see in other zip codes because we don't want to look at it. We'd rather be sick. Fortunately, scientific advances and, frankly, economic realities make that option less viable every day. The science is clear. Early adversity dramatically affects health across the lifetime. Today, we are beginning to understand how to interrupt the progression from early adversity to disease and early death. And 30 years from now, the child who has a high ACE score and whose behavioral symptoms go unrecognized, whose asthma management is not connected, and who goes on to develop high blood pressure and early heart disease or cancer will be just as anomalous as a six-month mortality from HIV AIDS. People will look at that situation and say, what the heck happened there? This is treatable. This is beatable. The single most important thing that we need today is the courage to look this problem in the face and say, this is real, and this is all of us. I believe that we are the movement. Thank you. I'm back. I hope everyone can see me or hear me. Um, and I hope everybody enjoyed the video. That, that TED uh, talk has been uh, viewed um, almost three million times uh, throughout the world. So, um, she's a powerful um, person to be speaking to the uh, whole idea of ACEs. Um, okay, so let's take a look again at some of the statistics that she was talking about um, and um, additional research that has been done. Um, and this goes along with a lot of what um, you may know about trauma and what I have done in my trauma and learning presentations. Um, the exposure to one category is, is rare. Um, you, if you more than likely have been exposed to more than one category of ad adverse childhood experiences. So um, there's a lot of co what we call comorbidity around um, what, what has happened to you as a child. Um, there's nothing usually that's um, specific and, and um, alone. 
And of course, uh, many kids that we might deal with on a regular basis as teachers or as SESPs or as clinicians um, are probably suffering four or more ACEs, um, even six or more ACEs. But for the four or more, more ACEs, you can see the percentage of increased likelihood of um, uh, poor long-term health outcomes. I mean, over 100%, uh, over 200% on all of these, um, more likely to contract hepatitis, uh, an STD, um, or even COPD. So it's not all risk behavior um, uh, outcomes. It's also um, things that you wouldn't necessarily connect with adverse experiences like COPD um, or things like asthma, um, even a, a shortened lifespan. Um, so there's, um, it, it's, it's, it's quite um, pervasive if you have um, several ACEs. Um, and then it goes even up higher um, to over 400% um, increased likelihood of suffering from depression or other mental health issues and that just the, the last um, statistic always just makes my heart break that um, you're over a thousand percent more likely um, to in, uh, attempt suicide um, with four or more ACEs so the more ACEs you have the worse are your health outcomes um, and um, you know you can't change your aces they always say um, but you can change the way you deal with them or the way people support you with them um, I'm going to show you a couple of interesting in what they call infographics um, when I first started working um, with aces this was the ace triangle um, and, and it always was um, I thought it was surprising that they had these little funny arrows on the right that co were called scientific gaps now this was the I think they stopped using this two or three years ago um, because the scientific gaps um, are no longer there uh, it was they didn't know why these adverse childhood experiences were creating these um, health risk behaviors or early death or diseases and disabilities. Um, we know now because we are able to look at um, what's happening in the brain, the development of the brain um, through functional MRIs and other neuroscientific ways to actually measure. Um, so the scientific gaps uh, no longer exist and, and um, I think it gives gives the whole idea of the ACEs a more powerful impact now that we can actually see the changes that occur um, with these numbers of uh, ACEs. Um, this is the most recent that I could find um, ACE uh, infographic um, and it's like a tree um, and it has the actual um, ACEs on the top, the maternal depression, the, these, these are different than what the original uh, ACE study looked at, um, uh, but it, uh, I guess it's not, it's all of them, it's the emotional and sexual abuse, um, mental health issues, physical and emotional neglect, but what they've added here are the adverse community environments, which can also impact the developing brain. This is not something the original ACE score looked at. Um, violence in the community, uh, poverty, discrimination, bullying, uh, poor housing quality, lack of opportunity, socioeconomic status, this kind of thing. Um, and this is the new, n the new look at ACEs. Um, and I did uh, attach on, on your uh, email this morning the Philadelphia ACE study. Um, some of the states are, are forging ahead with their ACE studies. Two of them, the biggest ones, are um, uh, Pennsylvania and California. Pennsylvania is really moving forward and they have collected a lot of data on um, adverse community environments. They were the first ones to look at things um, within the inner city and how they were impacting um, the, develop the long term outcomes for kids that were raised in the inner city with a lot of violence and poverty um, and how it impacts also um, academic performance. So this is the newest um, ACE info infographic. I think it's really um, interesting. And when you take a look at that Philadelphia survey, you'll see it's much more um, uh, intricate, asks many more questions. Um, 
and it's the the it's an interview type of thing so that's why you'll see on it that it'll say ask again or be careful when you ask and stuff like that but you can take your Philadelphia A score also um, and um, if if you are, are interested in looking at your adverse community um, environments when you were growing up so the impact of ACEs, um, Dr. Um, Harris uh, spoke at great length about that um, and uh, in, in a wonderful way. But just to reiterate, um, the, uh, the higher your number of ACEs, the more likely you are to have the depression or suicide attempts. Um, your brain develops unconscious uh, coping skills like somatization, which is the body's response to chronic stress. It's the physiological response to um, uh, adverse childhood experience, and they continue for a lifetime. Dissociation, which is a mental health issue um, because you are unable to deal with some of the things that are happening to you, so your brain kind of checks out. It's called dissociation. And then very relevant to what's happening now in the country, the opiate crisis. Um, many people are looking at, at it as the result of ACEs, the self-medicating attempts. Um, until very recently were misdiagnosed as the problem and not a symptom. Um, but most people would say, and there's a, a famous article that just came out in the last month about how we should stop looking at the addiction and look at what caused the addiction. Um, and that's been, um, I think, the way that a lot of us have thought in the therapeutic community for a long time. Um, and is addiction a disease or is it a part of the, is it the way that the brain has developed? So it's a different, it's a different look at even um, substance use. Um, so this, just to summarize what we've seen today, ACEs are common, more, more common than anybody I think um, ever realized. They occur, they occur in clusters, they're comorbid, um, they're usually rarely a single experience, um, so it's a complex experience rather than a single event. Um, they have a cumulative impact, um, and that's why the ACE score is so important. It's, dose, it's a dose response, so the more, the higher your ACE score, the more likely you have had neurodevelopmental changes um, as a result of your uh, traumatic stress. Um, it's a strong graded relation uh, relationship to health, social, and behavior problems throughout a lifespan. Um, and they're co comorbid and co-occurring. So um, they, uh, they start early and they continue a lifetime. Um, and there's a lot of talk about how to uh, change this up, of course. Profound, proportionate, and long-lasting effect on social, emotional, um, skills and development and that I think is what we look at and see um, many times especially in the classrooms when these kids are so disruptive um, and so challenging to teach and to um, keep them in, in, in the classroom um, because of their high rate of reactivity um, and their high rate of, of ACEs. So in a nutshell the altering of the brain development, the changes in the brain's architecture, um, creates inappropriate behavioral responses, as doctor, um, the doctor had spoken about, where um, you react um, and you that flee, fight, or freeze instinct um, kicks in, um, and that is the result of changes in your brain um, when you're very young. Um, the inability to regulate emotions, the dysregulation that we see so frequently for kids like this, um, where they'll have meltdowns, traumas, um, difficulty paying attention, not necessarily ADHD, but um, again, that dysregularity um, of their emotional content. Um, because of their um, adverse environmental stimuli, they probably have a uh, poor scaffolding um, in their learning ability. Um, language development can be quite delayed because of the lack of um, uh, ability to, uh, well, when they were very young, to not be spoken to and not to have that uh, serve in return with an adult who is speaking to them, reading to them, talking to them. 
cause and effect relationships are definitely um, damaged. Um, so the typical way of learning, which is ABCs, antecedent behavior and consequence, really falls apart when you have a number of ACEs in your background. And executive function, functioning is definitely impaired um, with a high number of ACEs. So, what does this ACE score um, tell us? Now, one of the things that people always say is, are, are schools using the ACE survey, the ACE score for their students? And I have to say that most schools are not, uh, certainly not in, in Massachusetts. They have tried it in California. Um, but the problem is that in this state anyway, um, teachers and school psychologists and anyone involved with students or kids are usually mandated reporters. So if you take an ACE survey with a child who tells you that they have been abused or neglected, of course, you're man uh, mandated to um, get in contact with DCF. Um, I think a, a more appropriate approach would be to um, do it with a family and to um, have a family understand that this is a way to help them um, and to stop ACEs that might be happening um, while the student is still, uh, is still able to be um, able to change their behaviors a lot easier than when they get older. Um, so we look at the trauma-informed uh, classroom. Um, there's any, let many things can be trauma-informed. They're looking at corporate of trauma-informed um, businesses. They're looking at trauma-informed schools, um, and then the tr the opposite of that. Um, so um, this is, I think, a quote. That, which was typical 25 or 30 years ago about kids with challenging behaviors. Um, they may be lazy and attentive, easy to anger, defiant, and lax motivation. Those things are all true, perhaps. Um, I would say not lazy, but uh, the, you know maybe unable to be motivated. But the reason is um, now we know is that there were changes in the early developing brain that has created a child who is more reactive than, and not as easy for them to learn. Um, so um, we are looking at um, a school that is not trauma-informed and the schools are reactive themselves and they uh, use punishments or consequences. Um, even positive uh, discipline can create consequences that have a, a, a paradoxical effect on the kids. It can actually make them worse. So the taking away of privileges, um, the lack of desire, it, it, it affects the um, lack of desire to learn, detentions, out of school suspensions, um, and typically, you know, a school will, will be asking, what is wrong with this student? Um, or what's wrong with this kid? Um, I can't get through to him. What's, you know, why, why, isn't, he, why isn't he changing the behaviors? Um, whereas on the other hand, on the side of the side, we see the trauma-informed schools. And hopefully that most of you that are listening are aware of the trauma-informed schools that are starting to be more prevalent in Massachusetts. It's been a slow start here, but it's catching on, I hope. Um, and it has a lot to do with the focus on social emotional development um, and focusing on that um, before academic achievement can be attained. Um, simply because if these kids are unable to come into a classroom and focus uh, because they're so um, they're coming from an environment that doesn't create a brain that can focus and they're more concerned about what's going to be happening when they get back home um, is going to create a student who needs a lot of supports um, and a lot of teaching of coping strategies um, and so instead of asking what is wrong with your student or this student, you ask what has happened to this student. Um, so um, when they're not considered, um, and they were not considered in Massachusetts up to about five, four or five years ago, we had zero tolerance codes of conduct, uh, which meant that every um, everything that a student did. Um, it was a formula for uh, a punishment or um, a consequence. 
and that um, it resulted in many, many students being suspended um, in Massachusetts. That's a figure prior to um, the, uh, the new laws that Massachusetts um, passed um, 12, 2013. Um, and then hundreds of thousands of kids being expelled um, because of the behaviors that may have been incurred um, because of these adverse uh, childhood experiences. In Massachusetts, <coughs> excuse me, we have passed several things. We have passed Chapter 222, um, and essentially what that says is that students um, cannot be suspended with an education without an educational plan in place. It also says the positive supports must be put into place prior to any kind of um, exclusionary um, discipline, any discipline at all. You, we have to take a look holistically at the students to see what we can do to support and help them. And that doesn't necessarily mean through an IEP, but of course, um, if an IEP can support the students with um, high numbers of ACEs, that would be awesome also. And then um, in the last administration, um, with the Gun, um, Gun Reform Act, they also, they also passed what was called the Safe and Supportive Schools Act. Um, not very well funded. Uh, and we continue to struggle to get funding for the Safe and Supportive Schools Act, but essentially what that does is it works towards um, trauma sensitivity in schools. Um, and it's kind of been a slow um, start, but certainly the, um, the, the right pieces are in place for that to happen. One of the wonderful things that just happened yesterday, the day before, was there was a uh, bill passed in the House of Representatives um, in Washington to um, put forward the whole idea of the ACE study, studied and to make the federal government trauma-informed. Now that will go a great length to make, uh, it's kind of an awareness campaign, but it would be wonderful if it passed. Um, we're still waiting, it has to go through the Senate, so we'll see. And they're also going to, just like they have a mental health month they will have a trauma sensitive ACEs study um, a month that's assigned um, and it will work towards um, making other states aware of the ACE study. Um, there's several ways that um, the ACE studies are um, able to be used in s different states um, and, and neither of them are in Massachusetts yet. One of the, both, of, both of them are through the Centers for Disease Control um, and every state does a, uh, maybe every five years, a survey of the health and uh, wellness of their population. And the CDC has a plug-in for the ACE study. Um, we have not chosen to do that in Massachusetts, but 32 other states have chosen to do that. Um, so, you know, that's something that maybe you can look at in, um, in the future for asking that to happen in Massachusetts. Um, so the current focus, hugely in Massachusetts, especially with the Centers for the Developing Child at Harvard, is to improve the quality of early childhood education. Um, because if we can get the kids early, um, and we're talking about very early childhood education, pre preschool, early intervention, um, Head Start, that kind of thing. And uh, monitoring the students' attendance and academic progress. We do know now that the absenteeism is a huge indicator of ACEs happening uh, in the home environment. So not only the Every Student Succeeds Act, but Massachusetts has put a, um, a focus on making sure that chronic absenteeism is addressed in schools um, in Massachusetts. Chapter 222 is really coming into its own, um, and that includes fostering a positive school climate, not just for the kids, but for the teachers and for the families, to engage with the families at a very early stage as soon as the kids come into the classroom um, to make sure that their, the family well-being is, is being considered. Um, and um, so the other thing that is a big push, especially through the Boston Medical Center, um, is what we call um, home visit visiting. Um, as soon as a child is born, 
um, pediatricians at Boston Medical Center, especially through Vital Villages, which is one of their initiatives, is to meet with the parents in the waiting rooms um, when they bring their kids in. Most people bring their kids in um, no matter what their socioeconomic status or um, how many ACEs the family is suffering for their well child visit with the pediatrician especially if DCF is watching. So the pediatricians will interview them around the, the ACEs in their home um, and make them aware of how they can change the neurodevelopment of their child by being made aware of what the um, adverse conditions um, can produce for these kids in the long term. So I've gotten, I have several um, pages of, of references here, um, and you could take a look, look at them. There, um, Some of them are the original studies, a lot of them are from the CDC, Helping Traumatized Children Learn, that's all about le trauma and learning, um, and more some, some more, um, more recent things that have come out um, in, in just recently, and that the one, the last one there is the um, the ACEs reduction resolution. So um, that's a good thing um, that that's happening. Are the neurological changes due to ACEs hereditary? That is a great question, Jennifer. Um, I think when the original ACE study was done. Um, epigenetics was not um, a big uh, field of, of research yet. Um, but unfortunately, I think if you were to ask the original researchers about that now, today, they would say yes. Um, we do know that epigenetics um, changes the way the genes express themselves. So if your ACEs um, are generational, like poverty is, or um, you know, neglect and abuse might be generational. You've been raised in DCF, and your children have been taken away from you, et cetera, et cetera. That is a generational ch um, um, uh, impact um, that has probably changed the expression of the genes. Yes, so unfortunately, it probably um, can have an impact. Um, how do you score your ACE test? Very easy. All you do is you, if ever you say yes on the ACE score, on your ACE survey, and as I said, I sent it out, um, that's considered one ACE. Now that's that's the original ACE study. The um, Philadelphia one is scored a little differently, more um, uh, more intricately, but the old-fashioned ACE study is just yes equals one ACE, and it's still, they, they keep coming out as many times as it has been redone as a study, as a survey, it comes out with the same um, the, the same results, and the results are actually um, becoming more profound. Um, so, have kids with have kids with ASD and ACEs been evaluated? Mm, another great question. Um, that's a real uh, that's an area of research that is difficult um, because um, ACE, the ACE study and trauma as a whole um, is is in its infancy. Um, and ASD has kind of raced ahead in its research because of the uh, crisis of how many kids are on, um, on the spectrum. Um, certainly it can occur, co-occur, um, but to parse it out and to dis distinguish between the symptoms of trauma or ACEs and the symptoms of ASD is at this time extremely difficult. There are some people working on it in Massachusetts. The UMass Medical is working on it. Um, but again, it's uh, there's not been a lot written about it yet. So let's see, other than gaining general knowledge of children, what else can we do in school and health offices to proactively help these students? Another wonderful question. I'm wondering if you're, Maris, if you're a nurse. <laughs> Um, but um, yeah, that's a great question. I, that, and, and many people are asking it. And there's, it's kind of, there's two prongs to it. For the first prong is that you deal with the kids that come in to see you every day and to positively encourage them to be engaged with you, 
um, to understand that the trauma and the ACEs are going to create very reactive kids, to understand that when you are trying to calm them down um, or give them alternatives um, so that they can be safe and keep the other kids safe. It's not an easy solution. I'm afraid that we haven't come up with a really good solution yet, other than the fact that, that students um, must be better supported in schools by all the staff. And that's what the um, Helping Traumatized Children Learn people are trying to do, is to kind of restructure and change the paradigm um, in schools for kids with these high ACEs. And don't forget, in a typical classroom, you will probably have 50% or more kids that have suffered two or more ACEs. So it's not like it's a small problem. Um, Proactively, I would say you, we need to engage with the parents because, and the families because traumatized children come from traumatized families. And um, one of the things that Renee and I, who is my supervisor and si sitting across from here, me here, we're really, really excited about the idea of community schools because community schools, and again, it's kind of a slow uptake in Massachusetts. They start up and then they kind of aren't sustainable. Um, support the whole community and all of the families at once um, and what essentially what that means is that they bring services to the schools not just for the kids but for the families too so they'll have food pantries at school um, they'll have health services at school not just for the kids but for the families um, extended school hours so the parents can come in and work with the students and the you know some mentors even after hours um, so um, I think it's a wonderful way. Um, a, a, I mean, it, it's probably going to be expensive and it's probably going to need another paradigm shift, but um, I think that's one of the great solutions. Also, the other um, solutions that we're trying out sporadically um, are the yoga and mindfulness um, that are coming into classrooms. And that, I think, is taking um, effect faster than anything else. Um, we do yoga at the Federation, um, and it really does make an impact, on, not only on your ability to cope with stress, but on your productivity. So that's you know, two for the price of one there, but um, yes, that's the teachers like the idea of that, not just for their students, but for themselves, um, because you know, teaching these kids uh, takes a toll on the the teachers themselves. Um, and Maris, I guess you are a nurse, so thank you for being on board here. Um, what would I ask my school specifically to know if they are trauma-informed? Okay, I think you just have to go in and say, so have you had any training or professional development in trauma sensitivity? Um, because I would love to have some of that happening. The Safe and Supportive School Act, um, actually, is, that's what the funding is about, to get that out there to the schools. Um, not to blow our own horns, but the Federation does offer trainings on trauma and learning. Um, and so you could certainly call us, um, Renee would probably be the best person to call um, at the RTSC to find out if your school could um, get uh, um, some, some training PD um, in trauma and learning. Um, we've got, I think, time for one more question. Um, yeah. and. Um, and again, it's if a child experiences four or more ACEs, what can be done to change their uh, outcomes? Um, if their environment changes by 11, um, can some of these outcomes be reversed? Okay, so the neuroscientists, um, I think in a depressing way, have decided that um, the, the time when the brain is most affected by ACEs is between zero and two and a half. That's why that early intervention, very early intervention, is very important. After that, we're not so sure um, how how to repair it. Um, and um, you know, I have adopted boys between six. Uh, they were adopted at six and eight, um, and their outcomes are dismal. They're now thirty-one and and thirty actually today 31 and 33 so um, yeah they we tried we continue to try and um, support them it is extremely difficult so um, I think we have to really focus on that very early intervention and give the kids that have already suffered um, ACEs as much support as we possibly can in a, in a safe and supportive environment um, 
Okay, so I think we're out of time. Thank you so much for being here. And uh, next month we're having a really good um, uh, webinar on school refusal. So um, we'll send out an invitation and um, hopefully everybody can come back and listen. It won't be me. <laughs> It'll be a, a, a doctor. So um, uh, we will see you then. Thank you so much.